Welcome to Rock Buzz. In today's episode, we're taking a nostalgic trip over three decades, landing in May 1992, a pivotal moment when the legendary Chris Cornell and his band Soundgarden were just beginning to make waves on the global music scene. So let's journey back and reminisce about the time when many of us were first introduced to Soundgarden's iconic album, Bad Motor Finger. It's been called grunge, but don't call it that in front of Soundgarden, the four-man metal ensemble that has been putting the rock world on its collective ear for the last four years. What grunge is isn't easy to explain. It's just part of the moody, atmospheric, intense sound that vocalist Chris Cornell, guitarist Kim Thale, drummer Matt Cameron, and new bassist Hunter Ben Shepard have created. But it's also a somewhat limiting term, a catch-all, for those who can't relate to the broad musical expanse this Seattle unit has utilized so brilliantly on their two major label releases, 1989's Louder Than Love, which was nominated for a Grammy, and their current smash, Bad Motor Finger. We're a very honest band, Cornell said. That's the only way Soundgarden can exist. Our music isn't that easy to digest the first time you hear it. You've got to go back and listen to it a few times before you really appreciate what's going on. But a lot of my favorite rock has always been that way. I think when people have a little trouble relating to what we're doing, they try to classify it. They try to make it easier to deal with. I just don't think that works with Soundgarden. It really is quite amazing the degree of fan and media ruckus that Soundgarden has created over the last few years. Back home in Seattle, the band was one of the pioneers of that city's hard rock movement, a scene that has subsequently yielded such acts as Mudhoney, Pearl Jam, and Nirvana. At first, they couldn't even catch the attention of a major label, releasing their first LP, Ultra Mega OK, on Seattle's own SST label back in 1987. But then their live shows started drawing comparisons to Led Zeppelin, mostly due to Cornell's plan-esque stage stance and the band's diverse musical attack, the majors started to take notice. While some critics questioned the band's long-term commercial appeal, no one who had heard them doubted that Soundgarden had something mighty interesting to say. We could have signed with a big label before we recorded Ultra Mega OK, Cornell said. By the time we got around to making Louder Than Love, we had the artistic control we wanted but we knew exactly what we were doing. A lot of our friends thought we were out of our minds to turn our backs on the big labels, but we wanted to make the album we wanted. And at that time, we didn't think we could do that if we were signed to a major label. Almost as soon as Louder Than Love was released, a small but ever-growing legion of Soundgarden fans were pronouncing the band as the group destined to lead metal, kicking and screaming into the 90s. While the album began a long, slow, but steady climb up the sales charts. The group hit the tour trail, covering the world alongside such compatriots as Faith No More and Danzig. As more and more fans jumped on the Soundgarden bandwagon, the group quickly emerged as a critical favorite, being hailed far and wide as one of metal's most inventive new units. At a time when hair mousse, eyeliner, and a power ballad had become virtual necessities, Soundgarden quite simply showed there was another path to success. Coming from Seattle, rather than a place like LA, has played a major part in what this band is, Cornell said. Seattle has always been a metal town, all the way back to Hendrix in the late 60s. It didn't start with what's become known recently as the Seattle Sound. The bands here just tend to lean towards a certain sound. It's just part of living here. Once everything got rolling, all the bands started to influence one another this whole thing has gotten caught up in a lot of hype. It's almost got a life of its own. The success of Louder Than Love was the catalyst that brought that Seattle sound to full public awareness. Glowing reviews in the international press catapulted Soundgarden to a level where their debut disc was nominated for a Grammy Award in the metal category. An unprecedented event for a debut act, but all that attention has done little to move this outfit from the musical path they chose to follow, long before they found themselves in the spotlight. Certainly on Bad Motor Finger, the band has taken the next evolutionary step in their artistic development. From the powerful opener, Rusty Cage, through the controversial first single, Jesus Christ Pose, Soundgarden, have proven that all the attention heaped upon them has been well-merited. 
We wanted to loosen up a bit on this record, Cornell said. It seemed like the best way to do that would be to use the same producer, Terry Date, with whom we worked on the last album. We're familiar with him, and he's familiar with us. All that work had already been done, and we could just get down to making the record we wanted to make. We cover a lot of different styles on this album, which is exactly what we wanted to do. Slaves and Bulldozers is the kind of heavy thing a lot of people expect from us, but then there's Jesus Christ Pose, which tells why I'm so irritated by the exploitation of Jesus on the cross. We recorded an album that we like, that it's pleasing the fans and the critics, is almost a bonus. For more news, stories, and historical articles from the world of rock and hard rock music, be sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching Rock Buzz 103.3.